afternoon. Breaking Barriers is getting a blue carpet on the TEDx stage. So this rug is from Nepal. In fact, I just picked it up in Kathmandu last week from the Weavers. It's made with Tibetan hand knotting with the finest hand-carded, hand-spun Himalayan wool and Chinese silk. It probably took two or three weavers sitting side by side over about three months to create this beautiful lotus flower design made of varying hues of naturally dyed indigo. You can't see it from where you are, but if you turn the rug over, you can tell it's hand knotted. It's made by hand. And in fact, about 500,000 individually hand-tied knots comprise the pile of this carpet. That's pretty cool, someone might say, at a New York dinner party. They mean the story, the handmade organic nature of the rug. It's definitely something worth noticing, a story to appreciate, and then to move on to another cocktail, another story. So I love handmade things, too. I always have. But it's a different story that I appreciate. It's a story that enables me to differentiate between two things, to tell them apart even though they may look exactly the same. It's the story about the people behind these pieces, those who create the beauty. And too often, those so stories are invisible and sad. Stories like Sanju's. Sanju was 11 years old when a labor broker took her from her village in the Himalayan foothills away from her seven brothers and sisters and her parents hundreds of kilometers away to the capital city of Kathmandu where she wove carpets day and night. It's stories like Sanju's and many others. These stories, they're invisible in a sad and frightening way. Because they aren't untold stories, they're just not being heard. It's like they're invisible in plain sight. And that really strikes home with me. So I'm Jewish, and as a Jew, at a young age, I learned about the Holocaust. I learned about how the world stood by while millions of people, millions of Jews, and others considered racially inferior were murdered in Nazi Germany. And the world knew long before any action was taken. People ignored the evidence. And I believe the same thing is happening today, in a different time, in a different place, and in a different way. So there's 35 million slaves in the world today, and many of them are children, kidnapped from their villages, or sold by their parents to labor brokers in hopes of giving them a better life that never comes. And there are 168 million children, though not officially considered slaves, are toiling illegally in the global economy, inside of homes, inside of factories, out in the fields, and down in the mines. And these children never go to school. And without an education, the cycle of poverty and illiteracy and slavery continues. These sad stories they're woven into our clothing, our food, building materials, and yes, rugs. Items we buy in the market here in Dhaka and in fancy department stores in Paris. And every single day, we touch the same things that they touch. But still, these victims are invisible to most of us, and they're probably going to die as slaves unless we bear witness to their plight and we do something about it. But what can we do? Should we wage a world war? No, not with the memories we have. In fact, we don't have to wage a world war. I believe we have a simple and systemic solution, a market-driven solution where if everybody participates just a little bit without making much sacrifice at all, we could elevate this system and create a world with no slavery. In the 1990s, people like Kailash Satyarthi, the recent Nobel Prize winner, and others risked their lives to break into these brick kilns and mines and factories, and they emancipated slaves. But this work of emancipating slaves 
Though heroic, it was a losing battle. And Kailash Satyarthi realized that. And so he did something innovative. He stopped doing that work and he created a new system which, that would get at the root cause. Because he saw that he could continue to rescue individual victims and more would just take their place. So he created this system, this market-driven system, that had so much leverage over the captors of these victims that they opened their doors to us willingly. And now, with a will, any company that wants to prove that no one was exploited or kept from their education to make their goods, it's possible. And this is the work that we've been doing at Goodweave. And I want to share it with you because I think it's a model that can be applied in other industries. In fact, we're already partnering with organizations in Nepal to bring this work into the brick kilns. So the way it works is that brand importers and retailers like Macy's in the US and 140 other brands around the world sign up to our system as licensees. And as such, they agree to random surprise inspections in their supply chains. Our teams of inspectors in India, Nepal, and Afghanistan are specially trained to investigate the supply chain at all levels, from factories to subcontracted cottage industry production right into the home. And if there's a child hidden away under a mattress or, or in a closet, and sometimes they are, our inspectors will find them. And after that, whenever we find a child, we offer them rehabilitation, near-term and long-term rehabilitation and support for their education. In addition, we operate a range of um, preventive programs in the communities, primarily focused on children's education, but a range of other programs for workers. In Afghanistan, for example, our inspectors are all women so that they can gain access to the female quarters. And there, we find many, many girls who've never gone to school, and now they're enrolled because that's a requirement from our industry partners in order to be part of the system. It, it, that really is the power of our model at its best. Um, so rug producers that comply with the system have the right to put a label on the underside of their finished product. And that label is the best assurance to everybody in the supply chain, from exporter to customs agent, importer, retailer, salesperson, and ultimately the end consumer, that nobody's freedom was denied in the making of the rug. And of course, one thing I didn't mention, this system only works when companies and consumers demand it. And they do when they can trust it. So earlier, I showed you the underside of the carpet so that you could see it was handmade. Now I want to show you the Goodweave label. This label has a unique number on it, a code, that enables us to trace back through the supply chain the exact place where this rug was made. So this system of industry partnership, inspection and monitoring, and consumer labeling has reduced child labor in the carpet industry of South Asia by 75% from 1 million children down to 250,000. We have a 6% market share globally, which is about the same as organics, and we're continuing to grow. And if we can grow at the same pace we have been, we can completely eradicate child slavery from the carpet industry by 2020. So in the, in, as I mentioned before, Kailash Satyarthi started this work in the 1990s. And in 1994, when he began to work through the marketplace, it was totally experimental. Nobody was working in supply chains or talking about CSR and child labor. But today, companies sign with Goodweave, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because they can see the future. And our label is a part of it. And eventually, it will become a business norm to address human rights in one supply chain. And that will lead to better products, a more stable workforce, and customer loyalty. Now we see the business case for this work. So imagine a world economy where more and more manufacturing takes this added step of protecting the human rights of its workers. 
we could completely eradicate slavery in the world. So this isn't impossible, but we have a long way to go. So I hope I haven't reassured you so that you can leave here today and cross this problem off your list. Yes, we have a proven solution, but right now it's only working in carpets, and we still have work to do there. But it's something that we can accelerate, and eventually we can achieve this vision. So remember the 11-year-old the girl, Sanju, who I told you about earlier. I want to share the rest of her story with you. And this is a short three-minute film about her. They called her Little Sanju. She was born in a village at the foot of the Himalayas, the smallest of seven brothers and sisters. My family was very poor. To get by, we raised cows and we made small fins for tourists out of bamboo. But we were always hungry, and no matter how hard he tried, my father was always in debt. When I was 11, my father told me I had to go to work making carpets. I had to leave with a man who took me to the carpet factory. The broker who took me away got paid, but they never paid my father anything. I made knots from four in the morning until eight at night. There was never a day off. I was always hungry. I cut my fingers while weaving and had to weave with cut fingers. My hands began to look like my grandmother's. I cried every night. I thought the rest of my life would be only this. It takes one million knots to make one 8x10 rug. In the 1990s, one million children were enslaved making carpets in South Asia. Then a hero entered the picture. It was you. If you knew how these carpets were made, you would no longer think they were so beautiful. And if you could choose a better rug, your buying power could end child slavery in the rug industry. From that simple idea, Goodweave was born. Here's how it works. To earn the Goodweave label, companies agreed not to employ children. Goodweave makes sure by conducting surprise inspections. When children are found, Goodweave helps them. Two years ago, a Goodweave inspector named Jonah found me in the factory. When I saw him, I was scared. But Jonah put his arm around me and told me it would be okay. Jonah took me to Homro Gar, a home for rescued carpet kids run by Goodweave. I'm the first person in my family to ever go to school. Today, thousands of children like Sanju have been educated and rescued by Goodweave. And because you chose the Goodweave label, three-fourths of those million children weaving carpets are now free. And Sanju? With Goodweave's support, she's able to attend her village school and live at home where she belongs. Now that's a beautiful rug that tells a beautiful story. Stand with Sanju. Insist on the Goodweave label. So Shoah is the Hebrew word for the destruction. And the destruction of lives happen when people stand by passively. Like the Holocaust, we know child slavery is happening. And we waited too long to take action in pre-World War II Germany. Today, we know we can solve the human rights problems of our days, and we can develop and grow sustainably. So now, I want to tell you a story. And carpets are for sitting on and telling stories. So I want to share with you the story about why all of this probably matters to me so much. When I was eight years old, my mother and my grandmother dressed me and my sister up 
and they said we were going to see Cousin Mark. Cousin Mark was my grandmother Helen's first cousin. And we were told to mind our manners and not ask too many questions because we were going to hear a very important story. And it was exciting because of the ceremonious lead up to this. Little did I know that they had deemed us old enough to hear the raw and personal account of how Mark survived a concentration camp in 1944. So that day changed me, and Mark's story changed me. He survived for two years in Auschwitz, tailoring Nazi uniforms and competing with other prisoners for scraps of bread. And one day, they came and they took him and they put him in front of a firing squad. And Mark fell into a pit of dead bodies, only he wasn't shot. He lay there still and waited until nightfall. And then he escaped. And he ran by day and he hid by night. And somehow he made it to Belgium. And he placed ads in the Jewish newspapers, looking for family or friends or anyone to help him. And my grandmother, Helen, saw the ad and she brought Mark to America to live with her family of five. And at 16, he came to live in my mother's home and lived as a brother to her and my uncles. <laughs> so, um, I'm just one generation away from the Holocaust. And the number tattoo that Mark revealed to me on his left arm really burned into my memory, like it burned into his skin. As I sit here today on the stage here in Dhaka, one of the places where the most innovative social, play, social change has taken place, there's still much more work to do here in Dhaka and in the world. My name is Nina Smith. I'm granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, and I want to stop child labor and slavery. My story is why I do my work. 20 million people died in Germany in the Holocaust. 168 million children are exploited in the world today for other people's gain. At whose order do they suffer? So may it be at our command that they gain their freedom. And what I want from you is to not to turn away from the conversation. Thank you.